Welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's webinar on the COVID-19 Data Hub. My name again is Andrew Haight. I'm an economist at the U.S. Census Bureau at our headquarters office in Maryland. And today we are going to be doing a couple of things. First, we're going to be, be providing an overview of some of the key programs that we have that are available in the COVID-19 Data Hub. My colleague, Billy Gamble, is going to uh, talk about the demographic data from the American Community Survey that is in the COVID-19 Hub. We'll talk a little bit about the statistics that we specifically selected and maybe why those statistics were chosen to be included in the COVID-19 Data Hub, the information that they can provide that can be useful to folks who are trying to understand the potential impacts of the pandemic on our local communities and, and its residents. Then I'm going to be uh, taking over um, and talking about the business statistics, the other side of the Census Bureau, the e uh, economic information on the employer businesses and on the self-employed people that are included in the COVID-19 data hub. In that portion of the presentation, I'll also talk about a couple of the programs that we stood up at the Census Bureau specifically designed to collect information about the actual impacts of the pandemic on our households and on people. Then I'm going to go ahead and actually do a live demo of the latest version of the Hub. Now I know when you all signed up to attend this webinar, uh, you signed up to learn about the new version 2.0 of the Hub. It's interesting to note that actually last night around 10 p.m. we launched version 2.1. So today we're going to talk a little about what's coming. Some of what I originally said was going to be upcoming, we've actually already released. And I think that is sort of indicative of how not only fluid this hub has been, but how agile the, the project has been. As the pandemic has evolved, so have the statistics that we include in the COVID-19 data hub. Version 2.0 was a substantial update to the Hub, and we'll talk a lot about what was included in, up, in that update and what you can actually use uh, from that update, how you can use that data. But I'll also talk a little bit about what we just updated in version 2.1. Finally, uh, we will give you a preview of some of the other things that are coming in version 2.2 and in potential future updates to the Hub. A key point that I want to make then, and I'll make it right again now, is that you all have a role in shaping what type of information is included in this hub. The feedback that we have received from our users um, in this particular program uh, on this particular project has been invaluable. It has greatly advised us on what information uh, that we want to include. And that feedback has not only come from private sector data users, but even from the federal government as well. So you'll actually see that in the, in the demo of the hub. Finally, we'll be taking some questions at the end. Uh, for those of you who connected via the audio broadcast, you will be entering your questions using the chat feature, and we will be addressing those questions at the end. For those of you who, do, who did actually call in on your phone, we'll be able to take those questions at the end via the telephone. So to get us started, I just want to talk very briefly about what is the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, you all would have to be living under a rock to know that we, have not, that we did not just complete collection of data from the decennial census. Every 10 years, we do a complete count of the U.S. population. And to a lot of Americans, that is the main thing that we do. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, I know what you all do once every 10 years, what do you do the other nine? I would be retired by now. In fact, we conduct more than 130 monthly, quarterly, annual, and periodic programs each and every single year. These include demographic or household-based surveys like the decennial census, but they also include a program called the American Community Survey that Billy is going to be talking about in just a moment. This is a fantastic resource that provides incredibly detailed demographic, socioeconomic, and housing data that you all can use not only to understand the potential impacts of the pandemic, but that you also can use in community economic development. Small business owners use these data all the time to research their markets and determine is now a good time and a good place to open the particular business I'm considering. So this is a, is a great resource 
It is a key data product that I send a lot of users to, and hopefully you all are key users of it as well. In addition to the American Community Survey, though, we also conduct 58 business surveys. Every five years, we do a complete economic census that measures every employer business in the United States, but we also do a census of governments and a variety of other programs. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Billy, who will now talk with us about the American Community Survey. Billy, it's all yours. All right. Just wait for the presenter ball here. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Andy. Um, my name is Billy Gamble, as Andy stated. I work in the Outreach and Education branch um, here at the American Community Survey Office. And I want to provide you a bit of information about the American Community Survey, which is commonly referred to as the ACS, and what it provides to the COVID hub. But before that, let's do some quick um, background information on the ACS. So the ACS is the nation's most current reliable and accessible data source for statistics on critical topics. And every year, 3.5 million households are surveyed. And the ACS helps to allocate more than $675 billion of federal spending each year. There are over 40 topics covered in the survey, and these topics support over 300 federal government uses. Now, ACS data is released every year through three key data releases. And this consists of our one-year estimates, our one-year supplemental estimates, and our five-year estimates, which is the data used in the COVID hub. So on the previous slide, I did mention there are over 40 topics covered in the ACS. The topics collected can be grouped into four main characteristics, um, consisting of social, demographic, economic, and housing characteristics. Social characteristics include topics such as disability status, education, language spoken at home, and others. Our demographic characteristics consist of sex, age, race, and Hispanic origin. Economic characteristics include topics such as commuting to work, employment status, income, and others. And our housing characteristics include topics such as computer and internet use, housing costs, vehicles available, and more. So as you may already be able to pinpoint um, some of these topics collected by the ACS can be used to measure, uh, can be used for measures for the COVID-19 hub to locate potential impacts of areas that may be more affected by the virus. And in just a moment, I will go over um, some specific topics that were pulled into the hub itself. So now in addition to the various topics covered, an even greater strength of the ACS is the vast geographic areas the survey provides data for. So the ACS covers more than 805,000 geographic areas when taking into account all three of its annual data releases. So as you can see here on the slide, the ACS covers geographies um, overarching at, at the national level and as all the way granular to the block groups. And in between there, you can see that there are also states and uh, counties. So both states and counties are important as these geographies um, are actually pulled into the COVID hub from the ACS. So getting to the specific topics in the COVID hub, so from the 40 plus topics in the ACS, we initially used um, incoming COVID related data requests to help determine topics for the hub, for the hub site itself. Um, these include variables on potentially vulnerable populations and variables providing a portrait of the current social and economic landscape. These topics were chosen with the idea to provide data to help decision makers focus their response efforts. So on the slide of the topics from the ACS that are actually in the data hub, as you can see, they cover several areas and are topics that are related to COVID-19. Initially, not all of these topics were part of the hub, uh, but over time, we have continued to add topics that are relevant to the pandemic and the populations that are most affected. So if you are interested in more information about the American Community Survey uh, and, the data, and the data it actually offers and provides, our ACS webpage is a good place to start. So um, on the ACS webpage, you can find our Why We Ask pages, which actually gives more information on the questions that are asked and what data is obtained from those questions. 
Um, you can also see a full list of, of our subjects in the ACS and much more. And also on the slide, as you can see, we do have a link for the COVID-19 data hub, uh, obviously right there on our ACS homepage. And please do remember that the ACS data and the COVID hub helps to show areas of potential impacts or areas that could be greatly affected by the pandemic. Um, but now I'll turn it back over to Andy, and he will cover some programs that, act, that show actual impacts from the pandemic itself. Great. Thanks so much, Billy. So as you can see, uh, the American Community Survey produces an amazing wealth of statistics um, in their programs. We've incorporated a small portion of the data from the ACS in the panel. And Greg, if you can go ahead and give me the ball, I will go ahead and go jump back over to the presentation. So awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. So as I was mentioning, um, we produce a lot of data at the Census Bureau <clears throat> that can be used to understand the potential impacts of the pandemic in our communities. Our economic census, our county business patterns, our non-employer statistics programs provide information about businesses in our states and counties and metropolitan areas and cities. And those historical statistics can give us an idea about the potential impacts to those businesses so we can forecast this is a community that has a certain mix of certain types of businesses. This community might be more likely to be impacted by the pandemic than other communities. But in addition to those sort of reference databases, we also realized at the beginning of the pandemic that we were going to have to create some new programs that not only measured the potential impact of the pandemic, but the actual impact too. And the very first of these programs that we, um, that we created is a program called Business Formation Statistics. Now, BFS is a program that we've actually had at the Bureau for quite some time. As many of you already know, one of the ways that Census Bureau maintains a complete universe of every known business in the United States is through interactions and, re and relationships that we have with other federal agencies. Each and every single week and month, we receive information from the Internal Revenue Service on people who have contacted the IRS requesting an employer identification number. Historically, we have taken that information, we've used it to update our business register, and every year we created a tabulation of all of those people that formed new businesses during that calendar year. At the beginning of the pandemic, though, we realized that these business formations might give us a real insight into how new businesses, how startups, if you will, have been impacted by the pandemic. So we actually took this annual program and, were, and changed it into a weekly program that showed how startups were being impacted throughout the pandemic. As you can see on the slide, we included some visualizations of data. And you can see at the very beginning of the pandemic, we, we noticed a marked decline in the number of business formations as companies who were considering starting decided to put their plans on hold and wait until the pandemic had sort of settled down a little. But if you looked at the more recent data, you'd see that many of these companies have now caught back up. In fact, you can notice uh, even as of week 36, for, for fiscal year or calendar year 2020, which the visualization on the right is for, we, not, we saw a marked increase in the year-to-year -year percent change in the number of business formations. These are businesses that would have normally started toward the beginning or middle of the pandemic, but held off and now have decided to do it a little bit later on. So this is a great program in terms of producing statistics on new business. Now, in addition to those new businesses, we also realized that we were going to have to do something special to measure how small businesses were being impacted. We knew that it was likely that small businesses were going to be impacted in a different sort of way than larger companies might be. So we stood up a survey called the Small Business Pulse Survey, or SBPS, that is designed to measure on a weekly basis the impacts of small to small businesses of the pandemic. Like the business formation statistics, they created a dashboard on their website that allows users to go in and actually look at the tabulated statistics. These data, as you can see, are shown at the national and state level. There's also some selected information available by metropolitan area, 
And these business statistics are published by NAICS sector. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that certain sectors have been impacted very differently than others. The second to last bar on the right is for NAICS 72, that is the accommodation and food services sector. This is the sector that we've all heard about as being greatly impacted by the pandemic. You can see how much more these businesses had a large negative impact, at least as of the date for these particular set of data. It's interesting to note that NAICS 61 and NAICS 72 are right, uh, and 71, excuse me, are right behind NAICS 72. NAICS 71 is the arts, entertainment, and recreation sector. This is a sector that some of you might have heard recently is going to be eligible to receive some additional recovery monies to help these performing arts companies and others sort of get back on their feet. I also do personally find it interesting to note that NAICS 22, which is the utility sector, and NAICS 52, which is the financial insurance sector, have seen a much lower impact. I guess we ought to be grateful that our local utility companies did not see a marked decline, uh, did not see layoffs and stuff, and that that has allowed us to have utilities, electricity, uh, during this entire period. Now, the third program I want to talk about is our Household Pulse Survey. Like the Small Business Pulse Survey, the Household Pulse Survey was designed to measure the impact of the pandemic on families, on households, on people in the United States. Like the Small Business Pulse Survey, they have created a dashboard on their website. You're seeing a screenshot of it right here. One point I, do, I want to make, though, about the Household Pulse Survey and their particular visualization that they've created You'll notice on the left-hand side of the visualization, there are seven categories, seven different questions that were asked on the Household Pulse Survey about whether or not that household experienced any kind of food scarcity or housing insecurity or whether they had difficulty paying for household expenses, things along those lines. These seven questions are just a fraction of the total number of questions that were asked on the Household Pulse Survey. There's much, much more data available, and I would really encourage you all to check out their data page and actually go ahead and take a look at that information. So I've included here on the slide uh, some information, the links to both the actual visualization here um, as well as their data page where you can access that data. Now, the fourth program that I want to talk about is our Community Resilience Estimates Program. This program was designed to measure the potential impacts of the pandemic in terms of the resilience of communities to deal with types of effects that are caused by a pandemic. In developing this program, they identified 11 risk factors that were specifically related to the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that certain characteristics of communities contributed to whether or not that community was affected in a greater way or in a lesser way. Communities, for example, that were very high population density, the spread of the virus was much greater in those communities. So we applied these 11 risk factors to the American Community Survey data that Billy just talked about, and in the, in the end created a visualization that shows for each county in the United States whether that county is subject to no risk factors, which you could sort of equate to being as a, as a high resilience versus one to two risk factors or three or more risk factors. The data in this program are being released um, each and every single, um, excuse me, for each and every single geography, uh, county. And one of the things I want to make, a point I want to make about the Community Resilience Estimates is of these four programs I've just talked about, this is the one that is likely going to live beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Our staff who work on this program are already um, considering or already researching applying dis different risk factors to look at the resilience of communities to other types of disasters. So if you think about a community and its resilience to something like a hurricane, the risk factors that you might associate with the ability for that community to deal with that hurricane might be quite different than the risk factors associated with that community dealing with a global pandemic like COVID-19. 
So we are actually already working on that. And one very important point I want to make is our staff are very interested in hearing from you all about the information that we are collecting. What are those risk factors that you think we ought to be uh, considering when we're thinking about carrying this program forward in the future? Now, these four programs that I just talked about are all included on the COVID-19 data hub. And in just a minute, we're actually going to jump out, and I'm going to show you what that hub looks like. In addition to those four programs, though, we also fairly recently stood up two additional data sets. Now, one of them measures information on how state and local governments have been impacted in terms of their sales tax collections. The Household Pulse Survey and the Small Business Pulse Survey programs both help us understand how households and how small businesses are being impacted by the pandemic but we also know that our state and local governments are likely being impacted. I know in the state of Maryland where I live, the state has seen a marked decline in the sales taxes that they collect for gasoline because such a large portion of us in Maryland are not commuting every single day to work. I regularly used to fill up my tank more than once a week. I'm now going almost two weeks between gas and fill-ups. That's certainly going to be impacting my state because they're not going to be collecting the sales taxes. So we created a special survey that actually collects information and is publishing data on monthly state sales tax collections. And I would really encourage you all to check this out. The second and last program that I want to talk about is the monthly state retail sales report. Many of you are probably regular users of our MARTS survey, the Monthly Retail Trade Survey. This is one of our economic indicator programs that provides amazingly timely data about how the retail sector has been impacted by the pandemic. Looking at the March data, you can clearly see that there are some retail-related industries that have seen a major decline in their sales, something like clothing stores, for example, whereas other retail industries, like non-store retailers, what we typically think of as online shopping, have seen a boom in their industry. These monthly retail trade survey data are invaluable to understanding the national impacts of the pandemic, but the data in that survey are only shown at the national level. We realized that the impact on retail sales was not going to be uniform across all states, so we are now publishing state-level information on retail sales, and you can really see how retail sector is being affected more in some states than others. Now, to provide access to all of these data, users, of course, could simply go to the individual program pages that I've provided the links to to actually access that data. And we know that there are some of you that are probably already doing that. I know at the very beginning of the presentation, Someone asked the question about, are these statistics that are available in the COVID-19 Data Hub also available in the Census Bureau of Data API? The short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is not all of them. Our data are available for download. Some are available in the API. And while some users, like apparently this one particular user, is someone who is familiar with APIs and is comfortable pulling bulk volumes of data, we knew that a lot of users were not going to have that level of expertise. They were going to need to have some of this information assembled to them for their purposes. They were going to want to be able to see visualizations of the data. So they could actually kind of compare one area to another. They were going to want to have a sort of pre-format, if you will, the data available to them for download. So the result of those discussions is the COVID-19 Data Hub. What you're seeing on your slide right now um, are some screenshots from the COVID-19 Data Hub. And I'm now going to kind of jump out of this uh, PowerPoint presentation and actually do a live demo of the Hub for you. So you can see what are the new things that were included in version 2.0 of the Hub versus what are the features um, that, um, that were there from before. So to get to the COVID-19 Data Hub, we go to the Census Bureau's main page www.census.gov. We put our cursor over Browse by Topic, and we click on the Emergency Management link. This is currently where the COVID-19 hub is residing. When I click on Emergency Management, 
the page is going to refresh. This is the page that we have been storing all the information about the different hurricanes and fires and floods and other disasters during last year. You all know that we had a very active hurricane season to the point that we actually had to dip into the Greek alphabet. Um, but this is actually where our coronavirus page and information is available. So if you click on the coronavirus pandemic uh, icon, then go ahead and click over here, we're actually going to launch our coronavirus pandemic resource page. On this resource page, we have a couple of things. At the very top, we have a link to version 2.1 of the COVID-19 data hub. As I said to you, just this morning or late last night, we deployed version 2.1 that includes some major updates to the hub. You can see those updates are actually listed here for you all to see. Below the link to the COVID-19 data hub are then the links to those four programs that I talked about, business formation statistics, the small business pulse survey, community resilience estimates, and the household pulse survey. These links bring you over to the program page for that particular program where you can access the visualizations that I was just showing you. You can access the raw data for download, et cetera. Below there, we have links to the Census Business Builder Regional Analyst Edition tool. And then below that, we have some predefined deep links into our data.census.gov platform for you to access key information from the American Community Survey. I'm going to go back up here to the top, and I'm going to click on the COVID-19 data hub so I can show you what, are the, what is the information that we have in this hub and what are the things that we've just recently added. So at the very, very top of the hub, we have a link to a document that tells you what's new, what have we recently added, and what's coming soon. We have a place for you to sign up to stay connected about this hub to receive notifications when we've made updates to it, and this is that very important feedback link that I mentioned. Please, 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 as you use information uh, from this hub and you find things really useful or maybe you find some things that you want to comment on, I would encourage you all to please in, to do that. Now, below these links, we have a couple of key statistics about the population age 65 and over, the uninsured population, and the number of businesses, both employer businesses, almost 8 million businesses with paid employees, and the 26 million or so self-employed people, what we call non-employer statistics. Below there is what we call the impact planning report. And this is actually where we're seeing the first change in version 2.1 of the COVID-19 data hub. Many of you know uh, that we have included information in this hub as of the latest vintage of the American Community Survey and our economic program. So in this update, we've actually updated the data to the latest American Community Survey data. I'm really happy to report that. And we've also updated our business data. So these statistics here that used to be from the 2017 County Business Patterns and Non-Employer Statistics Programs are now available for the 2018 program. We've also added some statistics from the 2017 Economic Census to the COVID-19 data. They were not in here originally. In addition, if you had clicked on this bar chart before, you would have seen a chart that shows data for selected four-digit industries that are likely being impacted by the pandemic. We got a lot of feedback from customers about those industries that we selected, wanting to know why had we chosen those certain industries, did we think those are the only ones that were being impacted, and what we realized is that while those were very informative, Looking at data at the broader two-digit make sectors was potentially a better way of doing it. So you can see we've now updated these visualizations to show information at the two-digit make sector level. All of these data can be downloaded and printed, um, and you can actually incorporate this into your own work. Now, this is a two-page report. This entire second page includes information, again, from the American Community Survey, some really good information that help people understand the potential impacts of the pandemic. I do want to quickly make a mention that this is where one of our changes that we are planning on doing in the future is likely to happen. We know that as we are moving into vaccine distribution, that some of the statistics that we have in this platform that were valuable during understanding the spread of the pandemic, the spread of the virus across the United States, 
we know that some additional statistics might be useful to help understand the distribution of vaccine across the nation. For example, we know already from looking at the group 1A and 1B and 1C and group 2 and group 3 that occupation is likely going to play a role in, this, in sending out vaccine to Americans. So we are considering adding some additional statistics here to the impact report that would help users understand those Now you'll notice that these statistics are available at the state level. The application automatically defaults to New York State, but yet it can go ahead and change the geography to a new state. And then finally, you can also go in and look at these statistics by county. So instead of looking at the data just for Colorado, if I want to specifically look at data for Boulder County, I can go ahead and click on Boulder County, and now we're actually see, seeing the demographic and business data for Boulder County, Colorado. Below the impact planning report, we have links to those four surveys that I was talking about. For three of the four links, we have actually built a second dashboard that supplements the dashboard that is available on the BFS, Small Business Pulse, and the Community Resilience Estimates Program. For the Household Pulse Survey, the link here brings you out to the Household Pulse Survey page where you can go in and actually browse the data there. We haven't actually created a separate dashboard uh, for the Household Pulse Survey. And in version 2.1, you can see we've now added tiles that specifically bring you over to those state sales tax collections and those monthly state-level retail sales reports. Again, this platform is designed to be a central repository for a lot of the information that we have at the Census Bureau to help people understand the potential impacts of the pandemic. Below these tiles, we then have these policy maps. The policy maps allow users to browse selected statistics that are shown in that dashboard at the very top um, at a more detailed level of geography. So, for example, you can see this map number one is looking at data on employer businesses from county business patterns. If I cycle through this list, you will then come to information about the accommodation and food services sector. This is looking at the sales per establishment as the color, and the size of the circle is the number of businesses. If I wanted to understand how is the distribution of, of accommodation food services businesses in Texas, I could go ahead and zoom in on the map. And as I zoom this map in, the map is going to refresh, and we're going to start to see county-level data. And we can do that further um, using some of the other maps. So this is a great resource to sort of visualize the businesses and the demographics of the areas that are likely being impacted by the pandemic. The very last of these nine uh, maps here is a social vulnerability index. This is actually data that we have gotten from the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, um, that shows how counties are vulnerable to certain um, issues. Now, these maps can, of course, be shared. We've added the share feature right here. And because this website was created for us by Esri, all of the information that we've seen so far is available for you GIS professionals to be able to incorporate into your own uh, platforms. Below there, we have incorporated links to some of our key data sets. We knew that a lot of users of the COVID-19 Data Hub were going to be interested in viewing this data online, but we also knew that there were going to be a lot of people that were going to want to be able to download the data and incorporate it into their own projects, into their own research into their own websites. So we have provided access to some of those data from this highlighted data sets page. And then way down here at the bottom of the page, this categorical data set search allows you to go in and access all of the information that we have incorporated on the page. I could go into the business characteristics tab, and I could actually go in and download each of the different data sets that we've incorporated into this hub. You can see here is our non-employer statistics data, state-level data, and county-level data from the 2018 uh, non-employer statistics, the NES program, the county business patterns, et cetera. 
Now you'll notice that the downloads are available to you in both Excel file format and as a feature layer. Again, working with Esri, they've been really great to work with because they've made these data available into a feature layer service. So GIS professionals who are used to using the ArcGIS uh, application and ArcGIS Online can actually incorporate these data into their projects. Now the last part of the hub that I want to talk about is the part that was really updated the most during version 2.0 of the hub. As we've been talking with federal agencies about the work that we've done on this hub, we had conversations with representatives from FEMA. They were pretty happy with what we had done on this COVID-19 data hub, and they asked us if we would be interested in potentially hosting links to some of the data sets that they have been assembling and making available as part of their work. In working with the Argonne National Labs, they assembled a set of data sets that were available for access and for download, but those data sets were only accessible to a limited audience folks who had access to the Archon site, username and password to get in and do that, which was mostly federal agencies. What they really wanted was for these really valuable data sets to be exposed to a much larger audience. And as you can see, uh, we thought that this was a great idea. We really thought that providing access to these data sets to a larger audience really not only celebrated the value of those data sets themselves, but also celebrated the value of mashing up Census Bureau data with other data. And you'll notice from the logos here that these data sets are not only from other federal statistical agencies like SBA and USDA and BLS, but they are also from private sector companies, Viction Lab, Wampley, Google, even the American Alliance of Museums to understand how museums potentially are being impacted. So to get to these data, we click on the Open Data Sets page and this will now bring us to a portal where we can go in and access those 38 data sets that we have provided links to from the COVID-19 data hub. Those data sets are organized into three broad categories. All of the data sets related to business and economics are available by clicking on this tab. All of the data sets that are related to individuals and households, sort of the demographic data, are available under this tab. And finally, all the data sets that are related to government services are available here. Below those three tabs, we have provided a select link to eight of the data sets under that broad category. So you can see, for example, under this category, business and economics, we have payroll, uh, payroll, excuse me, paycheck protection program or PPP loan data from the SBA is included, a key resource uh, that's available as well as things like weekly business closures from a private sector company called Wampley. As you can see on the slide, we give you information about the level of geographic data that is available there, and these Explore data links allow you to jump out and go directly to that program provider's data set page where you can then access that data. Now, I will tell you that this is a giant first step. I think, toward making these data accessible to an audience. The experience you will have when you go to each of these Explore Data Links will be different because, again, you are going to the SBA website or the BLS website or the BEA website or the Opportunity Insights website to access these data, but we are already in consultation and discussions with FEMA and others to see if there's other things that we could do to actually provide more comprehensive access to these data sets. Now, if we click on one of these tabs here, we get the full list of all the data sets under that particular topic. So we can see under this business and economics topic, there are actually 15 data sets, information from BEA, BLS, SBA, um, et cetera. So you can see there's a lot of data that we have incorporated into this hub um, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I would really encourage you all to check these out. Um, I have already talked to a number of data users that are already thinking about mashups that they want to now do because we have made these data accessible to such a larger audience. So I'm really proud of the fact that we've made these data accessible uh, because it really celebrates the value that we all can bring to understanding the potential impacts of the pandemic. 
So that brings me to the end of my main part of my demo. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to my PowerPoint slide uh, to allow us to uh, kind of close this out. So we walked through the different surveys and the different aspects of the site. We talked about the highlighted data sets and how you can access those data in their raw form. Let's now close this out by talking about what's coming in the future. Now, as many of you know, we are constantly updating these monthly COVID-related programs, those four programs that I was talking about. We will continue to apply updates to these to the hub to reflect the latest data. So, for example, some of you may have seen the announcement yesterday that the Small Business Pulse Survey, which recently completed uh, phase three of the Small Business Pulse Survey, is likely going to be moving into the future into a phase four. As many of you know who have accessed that Small Business Pulse Survey data, the questions that were asked on each of the three existing phases, the first three phases of the Small Business Pulse Survey, evolved over time. We started asking questions at the very beginning that then didn't make sense to keep asking in phase two, so some of those questions were removed. And we started adding new questions that made more sense as the pandemic was evolving, as, was, as it was changing. That will continue to happen as we move forward so users can make sure that we're getting data out to you that can help you understand how businesses are not only responding to, but hopefully recovering from the pandemic. In addition, we provide this update to the county business patterns, non-employer statistics, and economic census variables. These were just added in version 2.1. This was a what's coming slide. What's coming has actually happened, so I'm really happy about that. And again, we provided those additional links to those other Census Bureau programs uh, that provide related information. The um, state tax sales, uh, sales tax collections, and the information on monthly state retail sales. We are also in the process of adding a new dashboard from our international database program. We realized that in talking with users that providing some information not only about the United States, but also including some of the data that we have available from our IDB might be really useful. So we've actually been in the process of doing that. That will likely be added in version 2.2 of the hub. And finally, we are going to be updating the American Community Survey data um, to not only show the latest vintage, which we've already done, but also potentially include some additional data variables that are not included right now in the COVID-19 data hub, but that would, might be really useful to folks as we move forward um, into the recovery from the pandemic. I already mentioned and teased you a little about the fact that we are considering some industry and occupation type information, uh, but I just wanted to point out that that's a, um, a work in progress. We're still working on that. So to summarize our presentation today, and I want to thank you all for attending, um, the Census Bureau has an amazing uh, wealth of data that can provide information on not only the potential impacts, but also the actual impacts of the pandemic. Programs like the Business Formation Statistics, Small Business Pulse Survey, Household Pulse Survey, the monthly state sales tax collections, and the monthly state retail sales reports all give us information about how businesses and households are actually being impacted by the pandemic. We've actually written a number of America Count stories that feature some information from these programs that highlight things like folks that are younger that are living alone are being impacted in a very different way than folks who are living with someone else, maybe with their family. So those type of statistics are really uh, amazingly in, in informative. I would encourage you all to check out our America Counts website to see more about these other stories that we've written. To understand the potential impacts of the pandemic, our economic programs and our business, our demographic programs like the American Community Survey, County Business Patterns, non employer Statistics, and the Economic Census uh, can provide some really valuable information on how households and businesses are being impacted or potentially being impacted. And again, I want to put out a big plug to our folks from the Community Resilience Estimates Program. Uh, this is a great program that I'm sure will live well beyond the pandemic uh, to understand how resilient communities are to not only the pandemic, 
but also other sorts of disasters. <clears throat> in the end, we created this hub to present the data, data from these selected programs in informative, intuitive dashboards, in maps where you can browse the data, and in downloadable resources. We really want you all to be utilizing this information. And finally, as my last point here, again and again and again, I've said we want your feedback. We want to understand how useful this hub is to you all and the statistics that we have on here, and if there are additional things that we could do that would make the data more valuable to you and to other decision makers in your industry, in your communities, we want to hear that. This has been an agile project. Uh, it has evolved a lot over the just nine or ten months or so that the, that the hub has been going. So with that, I want to say thank you uh, to you all, and let's see about going ahead and taking some questions. And hi, Andy, and this is mine. Greg. Did you want to um, take some over the phone or some chat questions for us? What's your preference? Yeah, operator, if you want to see if folks have uh, questions that they, they want to ask over the phone, if you want to um, say something about them entering their questions via the phone, and while we're waiting for them to do that, we can take a couple of chat questions. That would be great, Greg. Sure. If you'd like to ask a question at this time, you may press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. Again, to ask questions over the phone lines, press star 1 and clearly record your name for question introduction. Just a few moments to see if we have questions over the phone lines. Thank you. Great. Thanks, operator. And um, Andy, so we've got um, – we've had a busy uh, chat line here. Um, let's see here. One question came in, um, and uh, the attendee wrote, I've had community partners ask why the Census Bureau isn't asking questions about masks. Um, let's see here. About mask wear in the household pulse and small business surveys. Thoughts on including that in the future? Yeah, great question. So. Obviously, the questions that we are, are asking on these programs are ones that we feel we can collect valuable data for and also are questions where other data providers are not already asking that same question. Um, as valuable as the data is that the Census Bureau is collecting and publishing about the impacts of the pandemic, we are certainly not the only U.S. federal statistical agency or even state agency that is collecting information um, on, um, on the impacts of the pandemic. And yes, there are other agencies that are collecting information on things like mask wearing and things like that. I know we've all heard the reports about the impacts uh, and how mask wearing affects the spread of the virus. Those are data that are actually being collected um, that help measure the impacts of mask wearing on others. So, I would encourage you all to check that out. Um, the 38 data sets that we have added links to in the COVID-19 Data Hub will represent a pretty substantial share of the total amount of data, but that list is not the full list. Um, even in the short time since that list has been published, I've had a number of users that have contacted me and said, Andy, I don't see the following data set in your list. How do we add more data to this hub? Um, that's part of that feedback that I so think is, is so important. So I would encourage you all, if there are other data sets that you have identified that you think would be valuable for us to add here, whether it's from your association or your organization or from your, uh, another data provider that you've identified, please let us know. So great question. Operator, did any questions come in over the phone? Yes, I'm showing we have one question, and your line is now open. Yes, Hello? can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. I am a farmer, a tree farmer, and when you ask the seven questions about the family household impact with the household survey, uh, are farmers being identified about that because uh, some of this PPP and the economic disaster loans, the EDL, uh, is not getting down to us. So we are being affected. Right. 
So uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear um, that you've not seen some of that. Um, what I would encourage you to do is check out the Household Pulse Survey website to learn about how we actually pulled the sample um, that we used to actually send out to those households to be surveyed. Um, the Census Bureau is really pretty good about how we conduct our sample surveys. I have spent 33 years working in our, in our economic directorate, the Census Bureau, and I've always been amazed about the lengths that we go to ensure that we have a good representative sample of businesses in our monthly and quarterly and annual and periodic business surveys. I'm sure the exact same thing has also applied to the household pulse survey, so I don't think they specifically excluded certain groups. Um, whether they oversampled a particular area or not um, is a good question. I would really encourage you, you to check out that household pulse survey website to see how were the households selected, what was the sample size of the household pulse survey, because that gives you some indication of how many households were likely, uh, were likely um, selected for the sample, um, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I would encourage you to check, to check that out. Now, of course, when it comes to distribution of money via these various different programs uh, that have been established by federal agencies like PPP and CARES Act, et cetera, those monies are being distributed to those different communities in a variety of different ways. And one of the things I'll say is if you look at some of those additional data sets that we've now added to the hub, you can see pretty quickly how things like PPP loans were distributed to businesses slightly different than the CARES Act money was distributed. Um, in many ways, the money uh, was distributed to either individual cities or to counties or even to the state as a whole. So how that money then got from the city or the county or the state as a whole to the individual households and businesses in their communities was somewhat left up to the local jurisdictions to actually make that decision. Um, so there's a variety of different ways. The data is really pretty uh, amazing to understand how we've been responding to the pandemic and maybe how we ought to be responding in the future. So hopefully I, I answered your question. Because it's affecting also our vaccine distribution. Being rural, there's very few hospitals and doctor sites. So as you're doing the uh, 1A and the 1B distribution of the two different vaccines, occupation, age, and location is affecting us. Yeah, absolutely. I know that as the vaccine is being rolled out, the different groups, the demographic groups that are being included in each of the distributions vary widely from state to state. I know in Maryland, where I live, uh, teachers were included in one of our first, our, our first groups, 1A and 1B, whereas in other states, teachers weren't going to be getting their vaccines until perhaps later. So it's, it's been an interesting thing. I think in many ways we are figuring this out as we go along, and each state has been allowed to sort of do their own thing. Uh, we'll see how that moves forward uh, into 2021. So great question. Thank you so much for, for calling. Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Operator, any other calls, uh, questions on the phone? I'm currently showing no additional questions at this time. Okay. Greg, any other chat questions we can talk about? Well, let's see. We've got a number of folks uh, thanking you for an informative webinar. Um, couple questions on um, social vulnerability. Uh, one says, what are the top line differences between community resilience estimates and social vulnerability? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So to understand how the Center for Disease Control determined and calculated that social vulnerability index, I would really encourage you to check out their website the link to that page is one of the links that's included um, in that list of 38 data set links. Um, I don't even want to try to do it uh, any justice. I know that I won't do how they calculate that, that index um, in, in any kind of way. For the Community Resilience Estimates Program, though, we determined what were those 11 risk factors um, that were the ones that were appropriate and we then applied those risk factors to the micro-level data from the American Community Survey. So basically, we took those risk factors, 
We looked at the uh, individual responses from the American Community Survey. We applied those risk factors to that, and then we then retabulated the American Community Survey data to show, to identify those geographies, those census tracts, for example, that met one of the risk factors or two of the risk factors or three or more of the risk factors or, for that matter, none of the risk factors. So we, we had a little bit more say over what we determined, and a lot of those risk factors were determined by consultations we had from other professionals, other organizations that said, yes, you need to make sure that you include age as one of the key risk factors, or maybe you need to include information on population density as one of those key 11 risk factors. Um, so, again, I'd encourage you to check out the documentation for the community resilience estimates to understand what those 11 risk factors were and, again, how we applied them to the data and, moving forward, how we might change those risk factors moving forward to be ones that are more appropriate for fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and other sorts of disasters that we experience in the U.S. Okay, another question is, is it possible to get household pulse data not in the interactive tool as a time series? Or would a user have to go into each week's table individually and pull the data manually? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the, the Household Pulse Survey website provides access to downloadable files that can be pulled down so you can do this work yourself. And many of those data sets are individual period time, period data sets. However, we just started releasing some of these data from these surveys in our API. So that's a perfect use case for someone who might want to pull data for multiple time periods, maybe every week that the Household Poll Survey was done on a particular topic that was asked in the Household Poll Survey for that period, the API would be a perfect way to go in and actually access that broader data or that data across multiple um, multiple time frames. So yeah, that's a that's a great a great use case for the API. Okay, a couple of questions came in on urban and rural data. How do we get the urban and rural data from the Pulse household survey data? Yeah, so I am not aware, to be quite honest, whether they published specifically the urban rural breakout in the household Pulse survey data. I know they have information at the national, state, county, and metropolitan area levels but I'm not sure if they actually applied that urban-rural breakout on there. Of course, we do have other geographic resources at the Census Bureau that would allow you to associate a particular county whether, with whether or not that county was primarily urban or primarily rural. So you could sort of do that association yourself, but I don't think we actually uh, published the data for the Household Post Survey in the urban-rural breakout. Um, what I would encourage you to do is please send me an email. My email address is here on the slide right now. Um, send me an email, and I will make sure I get with our Household Pulse Survey folks so that they can answer that question better than I can. Let's see. I think we've covered most of them here. If I'm missing folks' question, I apologize. Uh, Andy's uh, info is on the screen there. But, um, Andy, that... Uh, that's most of the chat questions. Okay. Billy, did you, uh, did you want to follow up on anything maybe that I covered uh, during the presentation that you want to uh, provide some additional feedback on? I think I'm okay for now. There are a few chat questions that came in that I answered. So uh, my information is on, our branch information is on the screen. So the users can feel, attendees can feel free to, to contact us by phone or email. Great. Okay. Well, again, thank you all so much. If there's no other questions, uh, operator, any more questions uh, for the phone? There are no questions online at this time. Great. Well, again, thank you all so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Hopefully, I have teased you enough to make you want to go out and check out this resource uh, that we have created for you to be able to access information about the impacts of the pandemic. 
Um, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedules, and have a great afternoon.